All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to what? What are we calling this? Episode one, episode two. We called the last one episode zero. I didn't notice it was zero. It was yeah, interesting. We'll call it episode one then. So technically the second recording, but it's episode one here of Raider Zone, the podcast. Again, my name is Jacob Batar. We got some returners. Chris Jacoby's back here in the in the station today. We got Tom Dry, but we've got two newcomers today as well. Mr. Jason Sank and Mr. Dylan Zepp. Jason Dylan, want to introduce yourselves to the crowd here real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name's Jason Sank, third year student here at the University of Mountain Union. I did some broadcasting with Jacob uh, along with my brother Blaine Reef. And we had a really great time doing uh, color commentary, and I was even the sideline analyst, which was a really cool experience. Yes, sir, he's a great interviewer. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Dylan Zepp. I'm also in my third year here at Mount. I get to run the football games from the booth this past year, which was very entertaining, getting to listen to everyone talk about me randomly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And Dylan is the goat at that too. But Tom might give you a run for his money. He's pretty good at that board off and stuff too. He's, he's new to the. He's new to it, but he's right. doing. We pretty got competition. Good. We got competition indeed. Oh, yeah. But we're gonna get into it here in Raiders on the podcast again. We're gonna call this episode one now instead of even though it's the second recording. But a lot of big news going around, particularly in the NFL and NBA right now. Really stuff ramping up. First, we let off the show last time with the AFC Championship and the NFC Championship. We're going to do the same thing here because now we know the winners of that. So first, the AFC Championship, Kansas City Chiefs, Baltimore Ravens. Big time matchup here this past weekend. But Patrick Mahomes proves why he's at the top of the AFC and then everybody else is just kind of following as the Chiefs ended up defeating Baltimore 17-10, to making their fourth Super Bowl in the past five years. Guys, really, your thoughts on the game and can anybody in the AFC really stop Mahomes? you want to start, Chris? I might as well. I don't think anyone can. You can't bet against Patrick Mahomes. Kelsey just became the all-time reception leader in the playoffs. Just past Jerry Rice. That's incredible. That's amazing. I love seeing stats like that, and I love Kelsey. He's from Ohio. So we got those Ohio roots. We are brethren around here, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but my takeaway is the Chiefs' defense, man. This is the best defense they've had in the Mahomes era. Their secondary is elite and they play sticky coverage. They recorded seven pass breakups and one interception. That was in the red zone. You got to give credit to second-year corner Trent McDuffie, who's an all-pro slot corner, as well as Legereus Sneed, who's one of the best man corners in the NFL, who just allowed one touchdown this year. But my biggest takeaway is they did a great job containing Lamar, and their defense is the real deal, and they can get the job done. For sure, for sure. Anybody who wants to go next? Um... You know, I, I think we saw with the way the Chiefs played against the Ravens on uh, on Sunday that they're almost the most unstoppable team in football, especially when they their wide receivers catch the ball and they, you know, get an occasional splash play on defense. But I think the most important thing is, uh, you know, turnover-free football. If they keep the ball in their hands, they're going to find a way to win the game. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you on that one. They just seem unstoppable on both ends of the ball. Uh, they went up against a very tough Ravens defense, one that's been giving opposing teams trouble all year, and they were just effortlessly making big plays. Mahomes was dropping big passes whenever he wanted to. Kadarius Tony was dropping big passes, but in a different way. But I don't know. I'm excited to see them in the play in the Super Bowl as much as I hate to see them win. But you know, it should be a really nice matchup against the 49ers. So you guys are taking a different approach to this than I wanted to. I just want to yell at the Ravens for a second. This is a Ravens team that has been able to run all year. They've had a good offensive line and a great running back core. Granted, down two running backs at this point. They still have Gus Edwards and Justice Hill behind the line, both reliable running backs. And obviously, Lamar Jackson, who I think is nearly a shoe in to win MVP this year. Mm -hmm. They had a total of just 16 rush attempts the entire game, two of which were Zay Flowers. When Lamar was running, he went 8 for 54, averaging 6.8 yards per rush, and Gus Edwards, 3 for 20, 6.7 yards per rush. That is a great start to a run game in the first half, maybe. Probably the first quarter. So I don't know what the game plan was there, but obviously it did not go their way, and they really needed to lean on that run more. Yeah, I agree with where you're going with that, Dylan. I don't think this game's as much Kansas City as it is Baltimore. I don't know about you guys. I'm tired of hearing about Lamar Jackson now because Lamar Jackson, he's a great quarterback. I'm not going to spite him for that, but he doesn't show up in these big moments. There were many times in this game where I thought Kansas City was going to pull away, but Baltimore was staying in there. Then Lamar makes a mistake. Or let's talk about Zay Flowers too. Zay Flowers, yeah. I mean, yeah. karma at its finest right there. The taunting penalty, he thinks he's all hot stuff right there. And then the fumble at the goal line. I absolutely love that personally because you don't act like that. That's not a professional's way. And I think it showed because 
The Chiefs were very calm, cool, and composed, even when things didn't look like they were going their way. Baltimore looked like a team that it was their first time hosting an AFC championship game and their first time back there in 11 years. I don't know, though. I don't think anybody can stop Mahomes anymore except for Patrick Mahomes in the AFC. I think he can only stop himself. I don't know if you guys think of, can think of a team that might potentially be able to stop them in the future, but personally, I just think it's Mahomes. Chris, you got your hand raised here, man. Oh, the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> Let's not go there. Pittsburgh, Let's not go there. Pittsburgh Steelers. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah. As much oh, as I really want to root for that AFC North bias, <laughs> this team just dominated probably the best team in the division this year. Mm-hmm. I'm going to blame it mostly on the Ravens themselves, but the Chiefs did come out on top, so... Yeah, I don't want to hear really anything. I talked about this last week on the podcast, too. I don't want to hear anything about Patrick Mahomes ever again. He came in as the third seed. Everybody's like, yeah, his receivers are horrible. They're still not all that good, but Patrick Mahomes still just carried them all the way to a Super Bowl run. So he is the most talented quarterback I've ever seen. I'm going to stand by that, and he's going to show it again here in the Super Bowl. But now leading into who they're playing in the Super Bowl, NFC Championship, very entertaining as well. Heartbreaking for a lot of people as well. The San Francisco 49ers, they defeated the Detroit Lions 34-31. to San Francisco, in the process, scored 27 unanswered points as they trailed in this game early. They were down 24-7 at the halftime break. But really, guys, thoughts on the game and really the Lions, they collapsed. What are you guys thinking about it? Yeah, I picked the Lions to win this game whenever we did the first episode that we recorded. But unfortunately, they just fell apart. There's a difference between being aggressive and reckless, and that's when Dan Campbell went for it again on fourth and three. He could have taken the three points, they could have tied the game, and we could have had a good bi- battle from there, but he went for it, they didn't get it, and it costed him the game. They did a great job involving Jameer Gibbs early, but he did not do too much in the second half. Goff looked amazing, and I do believe he's their guy long term, but at the end of the day, the 49ers did everything right in the second half, and I, my biggest takeaway is, is that Brock Purdy will make plays when it matters most, and he can use his legs. He's effective through the air and on the ground. So that's my biggest takeaway there. Yeah, I kind of agree. I think I, I think hindsight's always twenty twenty with the decision not to kick the field goal. I respect the aggressiveness. And, I mean, that's kind of the identity of the Lions under Dan Campbell. But, you know, there's – it's hard to justify not taking the points, especially in a game that will – if you win, you'll go to the Super Bowl, you know. So – you got to take points from whenever you can get them and however you can get them. Yeah, absolutely. I know uh, the Browns fans in this room, they, they've seen a lot of questionable fourth down, go for it calls in the past couple years with Kevin Stefanski. You know, you want to play aggressive, especially in the NFC Championship, but when nothing's going your way in the second half, you take the points wherever you can get them. Even if you don't trust your kicker fully, you got to give him that opportunity in this game just to stay in it. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking here at the drive-by-drive from the Lions. And Dan Campbell, he's known as the most aggressive coach in the NFL at this point. And it works out a good chunk of the time when it's not ref ball and two-point conversions get called back because the refs decide they don't <laughs> want to let them win. So I'm looking here. In the last, I believe it's the last 19 plays, 20 plays that the Lions ran on offense, two of them were running plays. Up until this point, they had leaned on the running game the entire time, and it was working spectacularly. Then finally, you get Jameer Gibbs fumbling, and that was the end of the game. He fumbled the ball, and the 49ers tied the game four plays later. After that, you had two rushes from the Lions offense, one being a Montgomery run for 16 yards on their second-to-last drive, and then their very final play on off, or sorry, second-to-last play, because they did end up going for it on fourth down. Montgomery runs on, I believe, third and goal with no timeouts left. They make the decision, or sorry, with timeouts left, but timeouts you need to save if you don't put it in, they run the ball on third and goal at the one-yard line. It doesn't go in, and right there, you know it's over. You're out of time. You need to get the onside kick, which is so unlikely to happen. It just fell apart, and I get them wanting to run the pass because that was what was open and was working a little bit. But at some point, you got to work with what you know. Just like the Ravens, you got to run the ball because it's working. Yeah, I mean, where I'm going to go with this, I think, guys, coming into the game last week, I predicted San Francisco was going to win. I thought San Francisco all year long was a better team than Detroit. And even though they had a horrible first half, I kind of saw it almost going this way. I don't want to say I saw the Lions blowing the lead kind of as in the way that they did, but I will say San Francisco is the better team all year long, I would have to say, with guys like Christian McCaffrey. Can we talk about Brock Purdy as well not being a game manager anymore too because – He made some big plays in this game when they needed it. So 
Brock Purdy is him. He's the franchise quarterback. What did George Kittle say? Wasn't it something like they had us in the first half, not going to yeah, lie? Yeah, he, he straight <laughs> up quoted the meme, and it could not have been more accurate. Yeah, it couldn't have been more accurate. I think I knew that this game was going in that direction right when Jameer Gibbs fumbled the ball in the second half. I'm a Browns fan. Dylan's a Browns fan. Jason's a Browns fan. Chris is a Browns fan. Tom is a horrible Steelers fan. But nonetheless, oh. <laughs> but nonetheless, we've seen that happen so many times, guys, just these momentum swings kind of when – Everything goes against your franchise already. That's what happens with the Lions. When you have an unfortunate thing like Jameer Gibbs, it was a rookie mistake. Jameer played pretty well in the game overall, but that fumble, that was costly, and I don't know. That's really, to me, what kind of showed that this game was going to go the 49ers way, that it just wasn't going to be the Lions' year. But I don't have it here on the script, but guys, just kind of a pop-up question real quick if anybody wants to answer it. Dan Campbell said it's going to be very, very hard for this team to ever get back. They don't know if they'll ever get back there. Can you guys see the Lions getting back to the NFC Championship at some point? Yes. Absolutely. They kept some of their coaching staff, like their offensive coordinator, opted to stay because he wants to take this team to the Super Bowl and they want to win. I 100% am behind Dan Campbell taking this team back there again. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think they'll make it back to the Super Bowl, but I think they would probably end up losing to the Cleveland Browns. But that's just my opinion. (laughs) Sure would be nice. (laughs) That's a Super Bowl everyone wanted to see. Yeah, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, Lake Erie would be on fire if the Detroit <laughs> Lions and the Cleveland Browns played in the Super Bowl. But who knows? Maybe it could happen. But really, that's going to lead to kind of our next little topic here. Just quick early predictions. The game's still about a week and a half out at the time that we're recording this. But some early predictions, some early storylines you guys are looking at for the Super Bowl. Uh, the two top five defenses squaring off. The Chiefs, they were a top five pass defense. The 49ers were a top five pass defense. And run defense, the Chiefs were a league average. The 49ers were top three. So I'm just looking at the defensive battle. That's what I'm excited for. I do have a bold prediction that there will be two defensive touchdowns in this game. So, But my early prediction for the score, I'm going to say – You can't bet against Patrick Mahomes. He's the most accurate quarterback across all three levels of the field, and he has the strongest arm in the league. Chiefs, 30-27. to I'd say that's pretty much the exact way I'm leaning. A close-scoring game. You got Brock Purdy, who has become, I think he was dubbed Mr. Relevant recently, which is (laughs) fair enough. He's earned this title. Facing off against, at this point, a man who's put his name in the top NFL quarterbacks of all time. You got two good defenses, two good offenses, one 100% held up by the quarterback, the other by an army of skill players. It's two different methods of playing offense, but I think 30-27 is about as accurate as it's going to get, Chiefs. Yeah, I think it's just going to be a complete offensive shootout the entire game. you got two really strong offenses, like Dylan said. Best quarterback probably in the last 50 years, maybe in NFL history. We'll see how many rings he ends up with. Um and I think obviously you got two strong defenses, but one of them's got to uh, one of them's got to give at some point. The the over under for the game is forty seven and a half, and I think I would bet the over on that pretty hard. I'm taking the over. I'm going thirty one twenty eight Chiefs. I, I think uh, I think it kind of comes down to a similar situation as last year, where the Chiefs are driving, they get a questionable call, and then they kick a field goal to win. <laughs> hey, I mean, I mean, yeah. you never know. You never know. It could be going that way. But I kind of agree with what you're all saying. Patrick Mahomes, I know I already said it in the AFC Championship segment that we did, he is the most talented quarterback I've ever seen play the game of football, and I believe he's the most talented quarterback that has ever lived. So I think Patrick Mahomes is going to get it done right now. I haven't really thought of a score prediction, but I think I'm going to go 28-24, so a little bit lower than what you guys are going. But I still think it's going to be a very competitive game. I'm very curious to see how Brock Purdy is going to play because he performed very well in that NFC Championship game. And like I said, he's not a game manager anymore. So I think it could be a quarterback battle just as much as it could be a defensive battle as well. But guys, that's going to get us out of talking about these past AFC and NFC Championship games and the Super Bowl. But some other big things are coming up here in the NFL, some award predictions. So a lot of different awards. We're going to touch on them all here who we think is going to be coming away with that award. First, let's start with the MVP conversation. Nominees for this award, Josh Allen of the Buffalo Bills, Lamar Jackson of the Baltimore Ravens, Christian McCaffrey, San Francisco 49ers, Dak Prescott of the Dallas Cowboys, and Brock Purdy of the San Francisco 49ers as well. Who do we think is winning the MVP this year, boys? I got Lamar Jackson of the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah, I, I think that's the pretty straightforward pick right here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Lamar Jackson. I want to go McCaffrey, but I'm realistic and know that won't happen. So uh, I will also go Lamar. You know, I 
kind of figured everybody was going to pick Lamar, but I'm going the same way as Tom here. I know this guy's not going to win the MVP, but the most deserving guy of the MVP, I think, is Agreed. Christian McCaffrey, which kind of leads, again, this is kind of going off script here a little bit, guys, but why do you think the MVP award is such a quarterback-driven award when you have a guy like Christian McCaffrey and a dude who, I'm not going to lie, I think he kind of got snubbed, Tyree Kill, not even on the list here, that could have potentially won an MVP. Why do you think that is just a quarterback award? Plain and simple, they're just the leaders of the team out there. Mm-hmm. You know, everything goes through them. The run game, pass game, everything goes through the quarterback when you go back to it. Yeah, pretty valid there, but I don't know. I, I would have to say Lamar is deserving of the MVP award, yes, but at the end of the day, I still would go Christian McCaffrey because he just had an incredible season, I personally think. Uh, but Lamar is most likely going to win that award. He's the betting favorite here in Las Vegas as well. But now... Since we kind of all came to a consensus on that one there pretty quickly, the Offensive Player of the Year. So nominees, Tyree Kill of the Miami Dolphins, Lamar Jackson once again of the Baltimore Ravens, C.D. Lamb of the Dallas Cowboys, Christian McCaffrey of the San Francisco 49ers, and Dak Prescott of the Dallas Cowboys. Let me just say something right here. Dak Prescott being on this list, I don't know if I agree with Dak Prescott being on this list whatsoever. I would have put Josh Allen on this list over Dak Prescott if we're going to put another quarterback on there. But Offensive Player of the Year, who are we taking, guys? Christian Christian McCaffrey, no doubt. He had 2,023 scrimmage yards in the year of 2,023 <laughs> and 21 <laughs> touchdowns on the year. He was by far the best running back and by far the best offensive player in football. Absolutely. I think this becomes a more of a conversation if Tyreek doesn't get hurt. I think he missed two weeks late, and that kind of mm-hmm. dug into him possibly hitting 2,000 yards. But he gets hurt. Is his Christian McCaffrey's award to lose at this point? <laughs> yeah, no, it's got to be Christian McCaffrey, one of the most dominant running backs we've seen in the modern era last 10 years of football just the guy cannot be stopped by any defense in the league Mm -hmm. you have to give it to him i completely agree i I think i kind of agree i I don't understand why dak prescott's on there but mccaffrey's such a dominant player that can once you get the ball in his hands he can change the game in an instant so i gotta go mccaffrey yeah i'm on the same way same wavelength as you guys obviously like i picked christian mccaffrey i think he's the most deserving for the mvp award as well as the offensive player of the year and i think we can all agree on this too thank god christian mccaffrey's not in the carolina panthers purgatory right now as well and he's actually on a good team i think he's gonna bowl out in the super bowl too so definitely christian mccaffrey right now he is in my opinion just a runaway favorite for the offensive player of the year Defensive player of the year now, guys. We've got a wide variety. This is going to be controversial, and I think we'll be talking about this one here a little oh, bit. Boy. We've got Deron Bland of the Dallas Cowboys, an incredible season for the cornerback there. Max Crosby of the Las Vegas Raiders. Miles Garrett, Cleveland Browns. Micah Parsons for the Dallas Cowboys. And TJ Watt of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Very controversial. There's a lot of deserving yeah. names on here, but what are we thinking, gentlemen? I'm going Miles Garrett because he won the Pro Football Writers of America Defense Player of the Year. And normally whoever wins their awards wins mm-hmm. the AP Defensive Player of the Year. But here's why. Miles Garrett, yeah, you can make a debate for TJ Watt, Micah Parsons, which if they won, I would be fine with that. It isn't that deep to me, and I feel like any of them could win it. But Miles Garrett had the second highest double team rate out of anybody in the NFL. He won all of his snaps with the highest majority of his snaps with the highest pass rush win win rate in the NFL and he does it all he's an elite run defender he dropped back into coverage and held his own for the first time I believe he dropped back more than 30 times in one season so quite impressive for Miles Garrett to start doing that he's doing it all right now and I believe he's defense player of the year this is where it gets hard because sitting in this room we're in an interesting position in the world (laughs) where four of us are browns fans and one of us is a steelers fan so this a lot of us have horses in this race because realistically i'll give credit to deron bland he went out and he took the pick six record Mm -hmm. i think his name's more of a good job you did good congrats for being nominated for the award i don't think he's in the running here same with max crosby he had a good year but you look at the numbers that miles garrett michael parsons tj watt put up they're they're above him and realistically i'm looking at it between miles garrett and tj watt even though for some reason a number of betting lines have tj watt as the third man behind micah parsons something i don't entirely understand because just on looking at the numbers just the numbers wise tj is beating miles and micah for tackles for sacks for all those categories i want to say miles but it's hard to pick him when tj has all these numbers and i do agree he was double teamed in insane amount and you got to take that into account. But Miles got hurt against the Denver Broncos game, I want to say week 12, and he had a single sack after that. 
that may have been the dagger that ends up losing him this award. I'm kind of leaning TJ overall here, which really is painful to say out loud. <laughs> well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll offer some aid then, Dylan, if that's all right. <laughs> you know, obviously, no discredit to TJ Watt. He's one of the scariest edge rushers in the NFL. I would not want to be lined up against him. <laughs> but they say stats don't lie, and yes, TJ does have the stats. But what was not mentioned in the talk about the double rate is that Miles Garrett's double rate was twice as much as TJ Watt's. Second highest in the NFL, people are afraid of Miles Garrett just because of the impact that he brings in all assets of defense. Miles Garrett would be my pick. It sure would have been nice if he played against the Texans, though. Mm-hmm. All right, Mr. Oh, Pittsburgh, oh, what do you boy, got? Oh, boy. oh he's got a oh, smile. Oh, 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 listen, you think this one's going to be good? Just wait till we talk about Matt Canada. <laughs> <laughs> all right, games played. Miles Garrett 16, TJ Watt 17. TJ had one pick, Miles Garrett had zero. TJ had eight pass deflections, and Garrett had three. They both had four forced fumbles. Garrett had 14 sacks, TJ had 19. TJ had 68 tackles, Garrett had 42. Assisted, solo, doesn't matter. TJ still has more. Tackles for a loss, TJ had 19. Miles Garrett had 17. I don't think I have to say much more than that. Watch the tape. Watch the tape, too. It only backs it up. <laughs> Watch the tape. Oh. All right. All right. I mean, we're, we're tied 2-2 right now, gentlemen, is what it looks like. And I'm going to break that tie because I think it is a two-man race. It's Miles Garrett and TJ Watt. At the beginning of the season and at the midpoint of the season, I would say Miles Garrett's running away with the award, personally. But I'm with Mr. Dylan Zepp. I am in severe pain admitting this. But for all the numbers that Tom Dry just mentioned, TJ Watt, Deserves to be the defensive player of the year. I think he's the most valuable player on the Pittsburgh Steelers as well. And I don't want to say he single-handedly carried them to the playoffs, but he was a major reason why they made the playoffs this year. And Miles Garrett, credit to him. I love Miles Garrett so freaking much. But in my opinion, TJ Watt, he is the defensive player of the year. But it could go either way. I'm very curious to see how that award pays, plays out. In his last five regular season Here we games, go. Here we go. Miles Garrett had one sack. <laughs> Just he did, he did, because he got hurt in week 11, I think, mm-hmm. with, against the Broncos, and from there, his stats just stopped. If, if he doesn't get hurt, he, I think he keeps up the momentum from the first I half agree. and he runs away, yep. which is unfortunate. TJ plays hurt all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. All right, all right. Well, with that one there, we're saying TJ Watt kind of as a consensus, but Miles Garrett definitely could still win that award. I believe he's still the betting favorite, he too, is. right now, Miles Garrett, yes. ever so slightly. So, who knows? We will see who wins that award when that comes out. Now, Offensive Rookie of the Year, guys, we were kind of talking about this at the top, like right before we came on, but just to name the nominees, Jameer Gibbs of the Detroit Lions, Sam Laporta, also of the Detroit Lions, Puka Nakua of the Los Angeles Rams, Bijan Robinson of the Atlanta Falcons, C.J. Stroud of the Houston Texans. First off, guys, I think we can all admit this is a great rookie class for offensive players. A lot of guys making a big impact, but consensus here, if any one of you just wants to name it, I know we all agree on it, so... It's C.J. Stroud. C.J. Stroud, yeah, C.J. Yeah, Stroud. C.J. Stroud. Stroud had a historic season for a quarterback this year. And, I mean, he, in my opinion, I don't want to say he necessarily ran away with the award, but he did differentiate himself. And I know you don't take the postseason into consideration, but, man, he was balling out in the postseason mm-hmm. there too as well. So, C.J. Stroud, Offensive Rookie of the Year. Go Buckeyes as well. I, I do want to mention these other guys because you're right. This is yeah, an incredible rookie class. Mm-hmm. Credit to the Detroit Lions drafting Jameer Gibbs, we had what initially was a very confusing pick, and mm-hmm. he has gone insane. Sam Laporta drafted a few rounds later. Excellent tight end. Puka Nukua drafted, I think he was round five. Mm-hmm. Now goes out and sets offensive rookie reception yards and records. It's insane. I'm excited to see how Bijan does with other coaching. Yeah, me but, too. But at the end of the day, this is another award that ends up slightly weighted towards quarterbacks because, again, it is the most important position. Mm-hmm. And C.J. Stroud did incredible. Missed some time, still Incredible numbers, very well done. Yeah, he broke every rookie record, essentially, too, this season. So, C.J. Stroud, definitely Offensive Rookie of the Year. Defensive Rookie of the Year, though. This is a little bit more of an interesting one here. Will Anderson is nominated from the Houston Texans. Jalen Carter, as well, from the Philadelphia Eagles. Joey Porter Jr. of Tom Dry's Pittsburgh Steelers over here. Kobe Turner of the Los Angeles Rams. And Devon Weatherspoon of the Seattle Seahawks. Gentlemen, where are we going with this award right now? I have Jalen Carter from the Eagles, who's an excellent run defender and pass rusher. Overall, I believe he was the best rookie, defensive rookie this past season. 
I don't know where I'm leaning on it. This one, it's it. I'd say it's more of a toss up between Will Anderson and the man Jalen Carter. I'll give credit to the other three, obviously. Witherspoon, Branch, and Porter all had good years, but these are two guys who made immediate impacts. And the numbers, the numbers here, they're leaning Will Anderson. He played one less game, still had another sack than Jalen Carter, had nine more solo tackles, what, and he got nom- nominated to the Pro Bowl. Jalen Carter, on the other hand, has two fumble forces and a fumble recovery. So I think this is a pretty close matchup, but I'm leaning Will Anderson here. I would have to go Jalen Carter, Philadelphia Eagles. I will be quite frank here. I did not know a whole lot about the defensive part of the rookie class, but Carter's stats, they, they speak for themselves. As a rookie, D lineman, 33 tackles, six sacks. I mean, that's that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. you know. And obviously the line on both sides for the Eagles has just been completely dominant for years now, and he's just contributing to that. Mm-hmm. So I would pick Jalen Carter. There's not a bad option on here, and I'm very tempted to go with Joey Porter Jr. <laughs> My reason for that, I have I. You, you yeah. have a reason, all right? Pittsburgh Steelers fan. That's yeah, the that's reason. the reason. <laughs> oh come on, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> however, however, he did shut down Jamar Chase. He did shut down DeAndre Hopkins. I believe he only allowed I think one touchdown when he was the primary corner in coverage as a rookie, and he's shutting down. I think he – I don't remember all the teams they play, but over the course of the season, I think he shut down six or seven top ten wide receivers. As a rookie, you can't ask for much more than that, especially when you're going out against the best of the best week in and week out. So i got to go with Joey Porter Jr. Okay, okay. First off, Joey Porter Jr., I think he proved he should have been a first-round draft pick. I know Absolutely. he was up there for first round, then he, he slid to the second round. That yeah. was crazy. First well, pick in the second round, deservedly mm-hmm. so. Yep. Yeah, well, he was 32, so in a normal year, he would have been yes. first round. Yep. But mm-hmm. great for the Steelers. Yeah. Love it. Without a doubt. But I'm going to go here with where Chris and Jason are going with this. I'm going Jalen Carter. Another thing to mention about Jalen Carter, kind of like how Jason touched on, he's on a loaded defensive line, so his playing time was a lot more limited than some of these other guys, but he still contributed in a major way. I think that, again, some great rookies on here. Probably I would go second with Will Anderson and maybe Joey Porter Jr. after that, but really, Jalen Carter, to me, he is the winner of this award this year. But now, very interesting one that we're coming up on here, Comeback Player of the Year. We've got the nominees. Joe Flacco of the Cleveland Browns. He was my lord and savior for a couple weeks there. Took us to the playoffs. we got to love that. DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills. An incredible story there. Baker Mayfield, my former lord and savior with the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> now he's with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. <laughs> then we got Matthew Stafford of the Los Angeles Rams and Tua Tagovailoa of the Miami Dolphins. This could go a lot of different ways, but what are we thinking right now? Uh, DeMar Hamlin, just because of the story. I mean, he legit died on the field, and mm-hmm. now he's back playing. I don't care how many snaps he played. As much I'd love to see Joe Flacco win the award, DeMar Hamlin is deserving. It is interesting. you got a class of four quarterbacks and DeMar Hamlin, who, again, he died on the field. It, NFL does love storylines. Mm-hmm. I think it's kind of hard to pick against DeMar Hamlin taking this. I would love for it personally. This might anger some of the Browns fans. For Baker, Reagan, Mayfield to win the <laughs> Comeback Player of the Year award. But we all know that's not happening. DeMar Hamlin is just the better story. You don't, like, that's unheard of on the field. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he's, you know, in full health, regard, or not even playing football at the highest level there is, it's just an incredible story, and you can't not pick him for that. Hey, shout out the script writers for uh, DeMar Hamlin. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> based off of performance, Flacco should win. You could also make the argument for uh, Mayfield, but like everyone said, uh, what happened to DeMar Hamlin was unprecedented. Unprecedented, excuse me. And uh, for him to come back and even think about playing sports, let alone playing at the highest level in the world, it's pretty impressive. I have to go Hamlin. Yeah, this is DeMar Hamlin's award. I mean, Joe Flacco, I'm not quoting him directly when he said this, but I know he said something on the lines of, I literally just got off my couch. This guy basically died. (laughs) Well, not basically. He did die on the field. So I think, though, that Baker Mayfield's probably the runner-up of this award. While Joe Flacco, definitely his story could be deserving of being the runner-up, 
Baker did the whole season long. That, that's where I'm taking it. Joe Flacco only did a couple games, and those couple games were magical, and I'm forever grateful for whatever Joe Flacco did for the Cleveland Browns. Thank you so much, Joe. But Baker Mayfield did it for a whole entire season. I said it last week on this podcast as well. Baker Mayfield went to Tampa Bay basically with his career dead as well, and he really revived his whole entire career. I think he's about to get a nice contract extension from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but DeMar Hamlin, he is going to win this award this year. And now, final award we're going to talk about here, Coach of the Year. A lot of deserving candidates here. Dan Campbell of the Detroit Lions, John Harbaugh of the Baltimore Ravens, D'Amico Ryans of the Houston Texans, Kyle Shanahan for the San Francisco 49ers, and Kevin Stefanski of the Cleveland Browns. Where are we going with this one, guys? As much as I'd love to say Kevin Stefanski for all the adversity the team went through, I got to go D'Amico Ryans. In his first year as a head coach, he led the Texans to a 10-7 and 7 record, won the AFC South with a rookie quarterback. D'Amico Ryans is my pick. It's an argument I've seen pretty often. They tend to give the coach of the year award to, like, first year up and coming or a coach that faced massive adversity, which this year would be Ryan, Stefanski, and Campbell coming up. What I what the argument I see is they don't give it to the coach that takes the team all the way, like Kyle Shanahan or Harbaugh taking it to the AFC Championship. They are the coach that led the team all the way. And credit to D'Amico Ryan. He is a first-year head coach with a first-year quarterback doing magical things. Dan Campbell has built this team up. Kevin Stefanski had... 90% of his starters on the injured list at some point this year. But John Harbaugh and Kyle Shanahan both led their teams very well all year to the point where Kyle Shanahan, I think he's deserving of it because now he's sitting in the Super Bowl with his team. Before my Cleveland bias comes in, I'll talk about the other two <laughs> that I think are also deserving of the award, the award and that's D'Amico Ryans with what he's done with the Texans, just completely turning them around, and Dan Campbell. He's a he's a he's a bit of an interesting play caller, that's for sure. But that's what a team like the Lions needs, you know, like they have been historically bad, just like the Cleveland Browns. And Dan Campbell led them to the NFC championship. He's done a lot of great work. D'Amico's done a lot of great work and he's got a long career ahead of him as a head coach, I believe. But I want Kevin Stefanski. <laughs> It's been too much pain for too long, <laughs> and we're finally having a somewhat competent playoff competing team. It's practically a miracle. I think it's Kevin Stefanski. Shout out to Harbaugh and Shanahan. Fantastic years for both of them. Shout out Kevin Stefanski for a, all things considered a very good year from a Steelers fan. That hurts. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, Chris. <laughs> And I love Dan Campbell. He, he and Mike McDaniel are probably my two favorite coaches in all of football right now. And what he's done for the city of Detroit is second to none. However, to go from 3-13-1 and 13 and one to 10-7 and seven in one year is just insane. I have to go to Miko Ryans. What he's been able to do with that team to elevate it, not just to the next level or two levels up, to go where he's gone with that team, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, to me, it's a two-dog race right now, guys. I think it's Kevin Stefanski and D'Amico Ryan. Stefanski did a wonderful job all year with all the injuries considered. And like how Jason mentioned, we're somewhat of a playoff-competent team now, too, which is definitely – the future's looking kind of bright for the Browns, and I love it with Stefanski. But for the reasons that Tom and Chris just said, I'm going D'Amico Ryan's. Think about it last year. Fans were rioting because Lovey Smith won the game <laughs> at the end of the year, so they couldn't get the number one overall pick. I'm pretty sure that they're very happy now with that number two that pick that they got in C.J. Stroud. Yes, so him and D'Amico Ryans definitely turned the whole entire organization around. I personally never expected them to do anything this year, and then they made the playoffs, yet alone won a playoff game as well. D'Amico Ryans, to me, is the coach of the year. But that'll do it for us talking about some NFL topics here today. We're going to switch over to the NBA now. So... NBA trade deadline, that's coming up next week. And I don't know about you guys, but that's my favorite time of the NBA regular season. Love to see the big names moving. But really, just to start things off here, trade deadline looming, what teams do you guys kind of expect to be buyers and sellers here at the deadline? Buyers, I would definitely say Lakers, Timberwolves, and Heat and 76ers. Teams who need to add talent, they need to figure it out. They're Well, not the Heat. The 76ers and Lakers are in a bad slump. The Timberwolves are red hot right now. But I feel like they need a backup point guard with Mike Conley out for a little while so Timberwolves Lakers Heat 76ers as buyers and for sellers Pistons Wizards and Hornets I would say the Bulls they need to blow it up but that sounds like they're not going to do that 
Yeah, I agree with you on the uh, the Pistons got to do something. They <laughs> they got to figure it out. They might have to just redo the entire team or just continue the tank. I don't know. The NBA doesn't really like when teams do that. I think a buyer is definitely going to be the Lakers. They are ninth in the West right now, and they've been okay in the last couple games. They've definitely been better, but they've been struggling again. And we all know the GM loves to make uh, some some moves of his own around this time of the year. Bring in five more veterans on the brink of their end of their their career. Make the playoffs, lose in the first or second round. So, you know, maybe maybe they'll get lucky this time. I think for the Sixers, what you got to do depends solely on how healthy Joel Embiid's knee it knee is. If I mean, if his knee is shot, I think you just I don't want to say roll over for the rest of the year, but without Joel Embiid, you don't have a chance to go win a championship. So, however, if his knee is not significant, I think you go all in, all in this year, right now, now or never. Yeah, for sure. So, where I'm going with this for buyers, I'm going to go Lakers and Sixers for sure. I think that those are two teams that are definitely going to be buying. The Sixers did the James Harden trade with the mindset of this isn't going to be the last trade that we're going to do. I firmly believe that, and I think they're going to go in, and they're going to try to buy some pieces there. Same thing with the Lakers, like how Jason mentioned. The GM, I've experienced it a lot of times as a Cavs fan as well. He likes to make a lot of moves, <laughs> a lot of moves. So with the Lakers kind of sitting in ninth, I still think that LeBron's playing great basketball. Anthony Davis is playing some of the best basketball of his career. They're relatively healthy. I know at the time that we're recording this podcast, they are both ruled out for tonight's game against the Boston Celtics. But for the most part, they are still fairly healthy. Got to give LeBron a shot. I mean, he's still playing. He's upwards of close to 40 years old now. Still playing at an incredibly high level. They need to buy. But some other buyers that I have in here, these ones I don't think anybody else mentioned. The New York Knicks have already bought OG and Anobi, but I'd like to see them go make one more trade because they're currently in third place in the Eastern Conference right now. So they could very well be contending, and they've got a lot of injuries that are happening there. So maybe go get one more piece. Sacramento Kings as well. They're kind of tinkering on, yeah, we could be contenders, and yeah, we might be falling off. I think they want to go more towards contenders. I want to see Sacramento go make a move. It was also a good story to see them make a playoff run last year, and I think they can make a playoff run too this year. Um, But as far as sellers go, the obvious ones are Charlotte, Washington. I think they're going to blow it up. I don't think Detroit's going to blow it up as much as what people think they will. But some other sellers I have on here. Atlanta needs to blow it up. Atlanta's just an absolute mess because I don't know who thought Trey Young and DeJounte Murray were going to work. I did not think that was going to work. When they traded four first-round picks for DeJounte Murray, I thought that was It was absolute. four. Bad. It was four. It was that's, four. I didn't know that. I thought bold. it was only like two or that's, no. a, that's a bold move. Yeah, that that was also the summer. Now, I still am critical of this trade, even though it's working out for them now, when the Timberwolves essentially traded five first-round picks for Rudy Gobert. I thought that was absolute <laughs> insanity as well. Um, but the Hawks need to blow it up and maybe even look at trading Trey Young. I don't think they'll trade Trey Young, but blow up everything and just start over, I would have to say. And then the other team is Chicago, I think. Chicago, they're just always tinkering on that we're going to be the 8 to 12 range, and that's about it. So just blow it up. I hate that Lonzo Ball still hurt because when he was playing, they were playing really, really well. But you got to blow that up as well. And maybe, just maybe, the Golden State Warriors might blow some things up here just a little bit. They're not doing too hot. But I don't really think they're going to be sellers, but I wouldn't be surprised to see them sell. They have no use for Draymond Green, Green at this point in time, and they mm-hmm. haven't for years. I firmly believe, and I was telling other people this, Draymond Green is eventually going to be a Detroit Piston. I don't think he's going to get <laughs> traded there, but here's why. Draymond wants the bag. Golden State ain't going to give him the bag. I don't know why you would give Draymond Green the bag as well. He'll get the bag in Detroit, and he's from around there. So I think he might go end up going to Detroit eventually. Maybe he gets traded? I don't know, but probably he probably won't be traded there. But we kind of went over some buyers and sellers here, guys, but who do you think the team is that's most desperate at the deadline to make a move? Los Angeles Lakers. Last year, they had a sensational deadline. They acquired uh, D'Angelo, D'Angelo Russell, uh, Jared Vanderbilt, and Roy Roy Hachimura. This year, they're around the same situation, tinkering around 500. They need to make a move. They made a Western Conference Finals one, run last season. They need to do something like that again. They need to make some moves. And I think they could look at a guy like DeJounte Murray. But we'll find out. 
Yeah, I think the Lakers are probably the most desperate at this point in time because they still have a chance to make a good playoff run like they did last year. They just they never really seem to have a fully coherent roster. It's always LeBron, Anthony Davis, handful of other decent veterans or young guys, and then just the rest of the team does not look like they've ever shot a basketball before. <laughs> I think that elite three-point shooters go to the Lakers to kill their career. And they they got to figure something out. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Well, I think, like we mentioned, LA's probably got to be the most desperate, right? Because this is one of the, historically, one of the most successful organizations in the association. And uh, being under 500, they're 24 and 25 at the moment. That, that won't cut it. I'm sure nobody in that organization will accept that, so I'm sure they'll make a move here pretty soon to get back on track. Yeah, I'm going to go Lakers as well in the Western Conference for all the reasons mentioned. Again, kind of like how I talked about just a few moments ago as well. LeBron, he's not getting any younger. He's close to 40. He's still playing at a high level. Anthony Davis is playing at a high level. I don't know what's going on with the role players because I personally thought they had a great offseason. I thought they were going to be one of the top teams in the West, I didn't think they were going to make the finals. I thought they were going to maybe do a rematch of the conference finals against Denver this year. That was my early season prediction. Obviously, it's not looking too hot right now, but they're just a few pieces away. I think they're going to package D'Angelo Russell for somebody. It could be DeJounte Murray, maybe Zach Levine. I don't know. It could be some big name they might bring in there and help save their season. But I'm also going an East Coast team here as well. Tom's Philadelphia 76ers desperately need to make a move as well. I mean... Joel Embiid, the time's kind of ticking on him as well just to make a conference finals at this point. He hasn't even made the conference finals yet in his career. So I think they're going to go all in. I think that they're going to need to make a move because this team's great, but they're starting to fall off here a little bit. They've proven that when either Joel Embiid or Tyrese Maxey aren't playing, they don't necessarily play their best basketball. They've fallen all the way from third down to fifth. I don't think they're going to fall into the play-in, but in that 4-5 matchup, you're going to have to match up with the Cleveland Cavaliers or potentially the New York Knicks. I don't see Philadelphia necessarily winning that series right now unless they go make a move. So Philly's got to go make a move as well. Very desperate there. But we talked about the teams. Now, guys, certain players. What players do you think are most likely to be on the move here at the deadline? I'll name three players real quick. Uh, DeJounte Murray of the Atlanta Hawks, Kyle Kuzma of the Washington Wizards, who could be a nice stretch big for any team who's looking for a guy like that, and Bruce Brown of the Toronto Raptors. I don't see them hanging on to him. He's a valuable piece. Seems like he'll be traded probably for around a first-round pick. Maybe a role player involved with that as well. But Bruce Brown could be a great great acquisition for any team make, looking to make a playoff push. Deep in thought over there. <laughs> <laughs> They're thinking. They're all deep yeah. in thought. <laughs> yeah. I, I like the Kuzma thing. I, li- I like that a lot. He's, uh, you know, he's still capable of, you know, being an impact player, but, you know, he's with Washington, I believe, right? He is with Washington, yes. They're 9-38. and 38. <laughs> I'm sh- I'm sure he doesn't want to be there. I'm, they, they have no chance of contending anytime soon, so, you know, if a contender could pick him up at a reasonable price, why not? This might not be a most likely thing, but this this I could see this happening. He's bounced around a little bit. He's always been a solid role player for any team he's on. Jordan Clarkson, yeah. he's stuck in Utah right now, and no one wants to be stuck in Utah, so maybe he could find a little bit of a better situation there. Yeah, for sure. Those are good picks. I'm going to go, I think DeJounte Murray's going to be moved regardless. I think he's going to be traded. Personally, I still think he's going to be a Laker. I think it's going to be a D-low type trade to go get DeJounte Murray, Then he's going to play with LeBron, and we'll see how that team goes from there. I also like the Bruce Brown take because he's got no business being on the Toronto Raptors right now. That's just terrible for his career right now he obviously was a major major piece for the denver nuggets last year when they won the nba finals signed that big contract with indiana very well deserving then he just got traded to toronto for pascal siakam so i think they can flip him to a contender he's on a relatively nice contract as well he's got a team option at the end of the year so teams can decline that option and maybe sign him back at the end of the year so wouldn't be surprised to see him move malcolm brogdon's another name to keep an eye on too as well with the portland trailblazers right now He was part of that Drew Holiday trade at the beginning of the year. He just simply doesn't fit with Portland. Portland's a very young squad. I personally think he might be a New York Knick by the time it's over as well. Back up Jalen Brunson. And, of course, he won the sixth man of the year. So Malcolm Brogdon very well likely could be getting traded as well. 
This guy, I don't know if he's going to be traded as well, but I would kind of like to see him potentially be moved, is Zach Levine. Because Zach Levine and Chicago, just break it up, for crying out loud. Because it's obvious he doesn't like Billy Donovan. Billy Donovan doesn't like him, the head coach of the Chicago Bulls right there is who I'm talking about. And that team just so dysfunctional in my opinion they have not reached their potential at all you've got three former perennial all-stars still guys that could play at an all-star level zach levine demar Derozan, and nikola vucevic it's just blasphemous that they can't do anything with it so zach levine to me is a guy that i would like to see be traded i think he's the only one of those guys that has value and we'll see though we'll see where that goes the nba trade deadline always something happens that nobody's expecting so we'll see how that goes but we will go into kind of our final couple topics here. So kind of a Cleveland sports and a Pittsburgh sports type conversation that we've got going on here. we got some big Cleveland sports fans in here. One lone Pittsburgh guy, but I think we can all kind of touch on this one here as well. I love it. <laughs> the Steelers made a big move hiring an offensive coordinator. The Browns also did too. So why don't we talk about both of those then? We'll talk about both of those now that I think about it off the top of my head. Okay. Pittsburgh Steelers. They hired Arthur Smith, the former Atlanta Falcons head coach, as their new offensive coordinator. I can make one bold prediction that's not very bold. He's going to be better than Matt Canada, but that's not saying much. Yeah. The Cleveland Browns, though, as well, hired an offensive coordinator, Ken Dorsey, the former offensive coordinator with the Buffalo Bills. What are we thinking about both those hires, guys? Uh, Arthur Smith, I, I don't know how it will work out, but I actually think it was a great hire for Pittsburgh. It didn't work out in Atlanta with him as head coach, but in Tennessee, he had multiple elite offenses led by Derrick Henry in that top-rushing attack. Now for Ken Dorsey, Buffalo's offense actually, they started winning, but they dropped off a little bit statistically whenever Ken Dorsey was fired. I was surprised by that move because I don't think he was the reason for Josh Allen's turnovers. I think it will be interesting to see if Kevin Stefanski calls plays or it will be Ken Dorsey, they're still deciding between that, but I think that's a great hire. I was looking more at the Arthur Smith hire here. It's very interesting. So he he came into the Titans org 2011, slowly going up the ranks. He was the offensive quarter in 19 and 20. In 2020, he had the highest scoring Titans team in 16 years, and it was led by Derrick Henry. It was led by Derrick Henry, and then at quarterback, you had Ryan Tannehill throwing to a combination of mostly A.J. Brown, and Jonu Smith, a very interesting duo there. I would say that mirrors a lot to the Pittsburgh team right now. I don't know, Tom, how you want to compare your current quarterback situation to Ryan Tannehill because I don't know what you're thinking there. But you got two name receivers and an interesting backfield. It's two names rather than one. You got Najee back there and you got the other man back there. But you can't just lean on Derrick Henry in Pittsburgh. That's the issue that I'm seeing here because looking at the numbers – they had, in his two years as offensive coordinator, the 31st overall passing offense and then the 30th overall passing offense. So, not very good there. In his second year, when he was setting some Tennessee Titans records, he did have the second overall rushing offense. But again, no Derrick Henry to lean on in Pittsburgh. So, I'm very interested to see how he approaches that situation. Well, I can't really speak much for the Pittsburgh move obviously as a Browns fan I've seen my fair share of bad head coaches bad OCs bad DCs if there's an upper management position we've had a couple bad ones um and Matt Canada he's he's comparable to some of the ones we've had at the Browns so anything is better for them you know you want to try something else out offense was a little shaky all season you know bring in someone new see if they could shake things up and find something that works for the Browns move I like it obviously like Chris said Buffalo's always had a really good offense I think we we're not really comparable to Buffalo right now but we have the potential there and I'd like to see what Ken Dorsey cooks up oh boy on on to Tom Tom. I'll get ready for this one boys I'm ready (laughs) all right Arthur Smith with the Tennessee Titans in 2019. They were 12th in yards with 360, and they averaged over six yards of play and a little over 25 points per game. 2020, they were second in yards with 396, and they averaged almost 31 points per game. Ryan Tannehill's career was dead, and then he <laughs> yeah. yeah he came back in over 28 games between those two years. He didn't play a couple games. He threw for 55 touchdowns and uh, well over 6,000 yards. Matt Canada. <laughs> Over two and a half years, coached 44 games, 
scored 30 points twice. Both losses. <laughs> 16 games with 21 points. In 2023, mind you, he only coached 10 games in 2023. Finished with less than 10 points four times. <laughs> he never finished higher than 23rd in red zone rankings, and he never had a 400-yard game. You know when the next 400-yard game the Steelers had after Canada was? <laughs> the week after they fired him. That's amazing. Arthur Smith will not be perfect, but he doesn't have to be. <laughs> he has to be passable. <laughs> At worst. <laughs> yeah. I think he's an improvement, though. Yeah. Yeah. The Steelers' defense, I don't have the exact number pulled up, but they are, they allowed somewhere to the tune of 19 to 20 points a game. You put the ball in the end zone three times. We, we're, we're, we're not the seventh seed. You know, we, we have a chance to win the division. Maybe the sixth seed. We're, we're at least the fifth <laughs> seed, right? If we, if we play – if we if if Matt Canada could have called games with the IQ of a high school offensive coordinator, we we would have been fine. We would have been okay. But instead, he derailed Kenny Pickett and just hurt this team beyond belief. I think Arthur Smith, if he can save Ryan Tannehill, can maybe not save Kenny Pickett, but at least make him at least an average starter. He doesn't have to throw for thirty touchdowns. He doesn't even have to throw for 20. If he can, if he can throw for 15 touchdowns and throw maybe three picks a year for, and just protect the ball and play smart football, we have a chance to win. He doesn't have to be great. He doesn't have to be Mahomes. He doesn't even have to be Kirk Cousins. He, if, he, if he just plays smart football, we'll be okay. And what uh, Dylan mentioned earlier with Derrick Henry, we don't have a Derrick Henry. That's okay. <laughs> because we have Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. <laughs> That's all we need, right? Last year, Jalen Warren had almost 800 yards rushing, four touchdowns, and a long of 74 yards. Najee Harris, for the third year in a row, ran for over 1,000 yards, had eight touchdowns. The Titans didn't have a one-two punch. Henry, at some point, got tired in every game. We have two guys. We can go at you for a full 60 minutes. We, we – Listen, the Steelers are going to the Super Bowl next year. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right. In all seriousness, I do love the hire. I forgot how bad the Steelers games against the Browns were because I know the. <laughs> I remember the first one. Your defense yeah. and Deshaun Watson carried the Steelers to a win, basically. I forgot the score of the second game was 13-10. to 10, And a pure, <laughs> a pure AFC North defensive struggle. I think, yeah, you hire a high school coordinator, he's probably doing better there. So credit to you guys. Hopefully you take a step forward with that nonsense. Uh, initially, I wanted Gerard Johnson from Houston. Mm. Arthur Smith wasn't yeah. really on my radar, but when I went back and looked at uh, the 2019-2020 Titans, I, I became increasingly, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, I said, Arthur Smith, I love you. <laughs> all right. I said that. All right. All right. All right. One, one more thing. Yeah, one more thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Shout out the Browns for uh, ending Matt Canada. It's yeah, you're welcome. As a, as a Steeler. You're very welcome. I love you all. You're very welcome. <laughs> you're very welcome. So to put it short, Ken Dorsey, good hire, I think, for the Browns. I still think Stefanski's going to have his hands all over the offense Absolutely. anyway. So, yeah, so Ken Dorsey's good hire. I don't see much. Arthur Smith, yes, he was good with Tennessee. What the heck happened with when you got B. John Robinson, Kyle Pitts, all those dudes? I don't really know, but maybe he'll revive it. He's better than Matt Canada. So, yeah, Arthur Smith, good hire for the Steelers as well. They both made pretty good hires there. But now, kind of for our final sports-related topic that we're going to go here, guys, just pick one of these storylines, but these are big for the city of Cleveland. Carlos Carrasco, he might not have much juice left in the tank anymore, Mm -mm. but he's back with the Cleveland Guardians now. So a lot of Guardians fans very happy about that. Then, of course, the Cavs. They remain red hot. Evan Mobley, DG, they are back now in the lineup as well. So pick one that you want to go with and then kind of talk about it here a little bit. All right, so I'll let uh, – I don't know. They're both fun to talk about, but I'll just touch on Cookie. I'm happy to see Carlos Carrasco <laughs> back. I'm just happy to see him back. I don't know, like, if he'll earn a 26-man roster spot. I think he'll get on the 40-man, though. I think he will be in Triple A, and I feel like he could be maybe somebody we call up if someone gets hurt in the bullpen. But yeah, I like the I like the signing. Certainly, that time of the day I get to talk baseball. I'm happy. <laughs> so, Cleveland Guardians are very interesting with how they approach pitching. First of all, because they they are a pitching machine. They print pitchers every single year. Last year we had three rookies make debuts. One got second rookie of the year voting. The other two were extremely good. 
The other side is what happens when we get to the end of their initial contracts. Players don't stay in Cleveland very long, and that's one thing baseball fans looking at this. Bieber looked to be a very hot candidate on the market. Shane Bieber, our all-star Cy Young winner pitcher. He's still on the team right now, and the rumors about him being traded have stopped. I'm worried they're going to start back up again with this Carlos Carrasco signing, because right now, our starting five, we have Shane Bieber, Tristan McKenzie, and our three rookies in Bybee, Allen, and Williams. A very, very good strong rotation. Could be top five in the league. I'm worried that they will see Cookie as, hey, we have a new fifth guy. We can just trade Bieber now and try and come away with some kind of prospect. And I'm worried because we do hit sometimes. We traded Kluber, and now we have an all-star closer in Emmanuel Class A. Kluber fell apart when he went down to Texas. However, that was striking gold on a name nobody had heard of. He wasn't on any charts. And while we've done that a few times, I'm worried this signing of Cookie makes them think they can do it again. And am I happy he's here? Absolutely. I love Cookie. I was at the 2019 All-Star Game when he got honored down on the field during the stand-up to cancer moment. It was awesome. This whole city loves him. I just hope it doesn't make the front office do something really dumb and trade Bieber or trade Sticks or trade someone that we need to have a legitimate playoff run this year. You know, I'm very excited. Hopefully we could bring him up into the roster at some point. Probably not. He's pretty old. But I'm going to talk about the Cleveland Cavs. Um, you know, we're finally coherent again. <laughs> LeBron leaving kind of hurt us a little bit. And we were in a, a pretty rough rebuild there for a couple of years. But I think we finally found our squad. We have a really young core of really talented guys. Like you said, just to name a couple, Mobley and Garland. But, I mean, we acquired Donovan Mitchell, which is one of the best moves we've had in probably our franchise's history. Yep. We have a lot of, uh, of kind of middle-aged, I guess is the term for it. Not middle-aged, but middle-aged in NBA terms. Max Struess is definitely him. George's Niang is occasionally him, but is still serviceable. <laughs> Jared Allen cannot be, like, you can't get past him. We have such a good young core and the veterans to back it up. I would, I'm very excited to see how the rest of this season turns out because I think we're looking at a top four spot in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. I don't really have much to say on Cleveland, but I am going to shout out a Roldis Chapman. <laughs> oh, what? I, I mean, what? yeah, I'll shout out a Roldis Chapman too. Raji Davis hit the home run off him in 2016, <laughs> hey. so thank you, a Roldis Chapman. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I forgot you guys had some history. I was just talking Pirates baseball, but that's not. Right. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, okay, I, I, you, okay, you yeah. guys signed I, him. I, 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 I didn't, I didn't mean any offense. Okay, yeah, that. yeah, no, you're good. You signed a dinosaur picture too this week. That's basically yeah. what you're hey, getting listen, there as well. Roldis Chapman's getting listen. We can market the heck out of it. Yeah, that's true. there you go. There you go. I'm going to go with what Jason was kind of talking about, too. I want to talk about Evan and DG being back. This team's not been healthy all year long. They haven't had a full healthy rotation whatsoever. So to see those guys back in the lineup, they scared me half to death last night when they almost lost to the Detroit Pistons. That would have been one of the most embarrassing things ever. But Donovan Mitchell is him, the 45 points last night. That was a big time, really matchup. And breaking news here from Chris Jacoby, according to Chris Fedor, Donovan Mitchell named Eastern Conference Player of the Month. So there congratulations we there, there, Donovan. Deserving. We love it. We love it. I love it you, there. Donovan. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah, so hopefully DG and Mobley being back in the lineup, they can reestablish that chemistry. DG and Donovan, they play well together offensively, obviously. Defensively sometimes could be a liability. So want to see how that works out. Evan Mobley hasn't looked too shabby yet. I think he's still getting kind of back in game shape. That's what he looked like last night. He just looked very tired. But obviously, coming off of knee surgery, you miss six weeks. You're going to be a little rusty at first. So the Cavs, I want to keep my eye on them heading up into the All-Star break. I think they're in a very good spot right now. They're in fourth in the Eastern Conference. They're battling with the Knicks for the third seed, though. And wouldn't be surprised if they eventually get in there. They're not going to make a move at the deadline either. They're just going to go on the buyout market. And that is totally fine because this team, very, very complete, I think, right now, especially when they're healthy. But – one final thing here, guys. So just a little fun question here. Nothing really with any current topics. But for our last call question of the day, what former player from any of your favorite teams would you like to see come back and sign with your team for one more year? This is inspired, of course, by Cookie coming back to the Cleveland Guardians. But just curious to hear this. Uh, prime Josh Gordon in 2013. <laughs> 87 receptions, 1,600 yards, which led the league in nine touchdowns. That was my favorite player to watch, man, when he played. If he just if he just stayed off the Zaw a little bit, he would have been just fine. Like 
He could have been a top five receiver of all time. I'm not even trying to <laughs> like sound crazy. You know the quarterbacks he did that with, like Jake Delhomme and yeah. Jason Campbell. He had Brian Hoyer for a few years, and he was around all the way till 2018. Probably played with half the names on he the He played with half names the names. Uh, While well, he wasn't suspended. Yeah. Because he was suspended for a lot of games. I don't know the exact number, but it was a lot. But Josh Corden. I'll, I'll go back to baseball. I'm high on the prospects we got coming up. I think we got some power hitting. But if you tell me we could re-sign Carlos Santana for one year, yes, I think he was incredible in Cleveland. He's got a bunch of our all-time stat records. He's really high up on the home run numbers. We bring him back for one year. I think he brings some veteran leadership to our extremely young roster. He brings some power. And uh, Cookie, I'm happy he's back. But Carlos Santana coming back would be incredible to see actual production from one of our favorite old veterans. I'll start this off by saying Josh Gordon under the NFL's current drug policy would be a top three receiver in the league. <laughs> I am going with a different Josh from the Browns, though. So give me Josh Gordon. Reti- er, <laughs> not, my, not Josh Gordon. Josh Cribs <laughs> returning <laughs> kicks yeah, yeah, Cribs, and yeah. taking snaps at the Wildcat. That was an absolute electric time to be a Browns fan because that was the best five and 11 seasons you would ever see in your entire life. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. That was fun. I got to go hockey here. Okay. Oh, whoa, okay. we got to go okay. hockey. We, we got to add some hockey to the show. Yeah. My, right. one of my favorite athletes of all time and my favorite penguin of all time. I love Sidney Crosby. But Said the kid, yes. He's him. Mark Andre Fleury. That's Ooh. a good one. That this, is a very good one. When growing up, Golden when I would play street hockey, this is the guy I try to emulate every time. He was well, w- watching him when I first got into hockey. Was just you know, it was different. There was something special about it. You know, he leaves. Yeah, I cried. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually cry. <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, you know, statistically, he's like the second best goalie of all time now, behind yeah. uh, Brodeur. So, yeah. I miss you, Flower. Yeah, isn't he still kicking it in the NHL too right He's now? He's in the Wild right now. Minnesota, Minnesota Wild. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 I miss him. Come yeah, he's been. Now. He had a good little run there with uh, the Golden Knights too. Yes. There when they, he, he, when he was first cooking. Came. Yeah, he was cooking there. But All right, it's a good pick. Let's see this. I'm going old, old, old oh, school. Oh I never saw this guy play while I was alive. However, I watched a bunch of his highlights, and I used to be a hooper back in the day a little bit yeah. in high school, so I used to emulate my jump shot off of him, and I would just love to see him in today's current NBA. Mark Price, indeed. Chris Jacoby, yes. Mark Price. I would love to see Mark Price. I know, Dylan, you might not know who he is. I don't know is. who that is. You don't Dylan, know who Mark he's got the number 25 right? up in the rafters for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Okay, he's one of the greatest yeah. Cleveland Cavaliers. He's probably the greatest Cleveland Cavalier not named LeBron James, Kyrie Irving. We'll throw, like, Kevin Love in there, too. Maybe. Okay. He's... One of the greatest Stand Cleveland up. Cavalier players of all time. I had the pleasure of meeting him one time, which was oh, one of the great. greatest moments of my life. And Mark Price, he was an elite three-point shooter back in the day. Steph Curry himself has said that he's looked at some Mark Price highlights and tried to emulate his jump shot off him. He's one of the most accurate three-point shooters of all time, one of the most accurate free-throw shooters of all time, should be in the Basketball Hall of Fame. So if anybody on that committee is listening to me right now, put this man <laughs> in the Hall of Fame right now because Mark Price needs some respect on his name. He in the NBA today, he's dropping 25, 30 points per game. He's dishing out the assist. Mark Price, come back to the Cleveland Cavaliers, even though you're about 60 years old or so like that. We'll take you. But, guys, this was a lot of fun. Episode one is what we're calling it, even though it's the second recording. We love it. We love it, though. But we'll do this again sometime. But thank you all for listening. Have a great time. And go Brownies. Go Cavs. Go whatever. Screw the Steelers. We don't like the Steelers. Here we go, Steelers. Here we go. He's a free agent. Alrighty. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>